All right, we're going to get started here. Uh, my name is Kim Metcalf, and I am the editor of In Sisterhood, the history of Camp 2 of the Alaska Native Sisterhood. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the book. Um, we have one, one, one of our participants here is Liz Dodd, who was the editor's editor and um, the, cop, the proofreader on the book. And I'm going to let her go first because she's taking a break from work. Um, normally, I would defer to the elders, but because Liz is taking time off from work, I would like her to um, be able to go first. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank everybody who participated in this book. We have many of the people here who are featured in the book. If you don't have a copy of it, we have copies available outside for $15, a special uh, convention or uh, conference deal. We usually sell them for $20, but um, it's a great opportunity to have these folks sign the copies of the books. Uh, our first book signing was wonderful because we had so many of the people that are featured in it there to sign copies, and um, it was really a great event. These folks uh, gave a lot of time to being interviewed, and they allowed us access to their photo collections, um, in addition to their memories of growing up in Juneau and um, what the effect of the Alaska Native Sisterhood had on their lives, um, the lives of their mothers and uh, their relatives. I'd uh, also like to thank uh, Dick and Nora Dauenhauer and Harold Jacobs for their help with Clinkett language in the book. I had no idea how to spell things. Uh, the other thing that came in very handy um, during the uh, research in the book was Andy Hope's Clinkett country map. Um, that really helped me because I had very little understanding of the clan system and people would tell me what clan they were from and I could locate it on the map and also um, figure out how to spell it correctly. So that map was an invaluable resource. Um, I'd also like to thank the National Park Service Historic Preservation Fund. Uh, that uh, fund was uh, the first, we wrote a grant to that fund that was uh, Alberta Aspen and uh, it was actually her idea to write a book about the elders. I'm not sure if Alberta's going to be able to make it. Oh no, Dolores says uh, not. But she had an idea to write a book about the Camp Two elders and um, pointed out this grant and Dolores was also involved in, uh, we were kind of just tossing around the idea. Uh, we wrote the grant, it was one of those last minute deals, we checked it out on the internet and it had a deadline of, um, what, like next week or something. <laughs> so we basically threw together this grant and um, Alberta did the financial part of it. Um, I think that uh, the reason it got funded, there was obviously probably hundreds and maybe even thousands of other grant applications for this money, but there's been so little done on women, and particularly little done on Clinkett women. In fact, this is the first book-length history of Clinkett women ever written. And it's not, I mean, it's, it's an oral history, and it's uh, linked together with history of Juneau and Alaska. So um, I think that's the reason the National Park Service saw some um, interest in it. Also, Susan Kraft needs to be uh, thanked because she did the layout and the design. It's a beautiful design. Um, she's told me that she's quit designing books after this one. <laughs> I don't think we were what pushed her over the edge, but she's also a fine artist and she's just devoting her time to painting now. She's um, got a big show coming up and, and she wants to uh, just devote her time to doing what she really likes to do. I'd also like to thank my brother Peter Metcalf. He's been a terrific um, supporter. He had done many books before this and uh, really was invaluable to me to uh, tell me how to do it, how to put a book together. Uh, that was very difficult for someone who had never done a book before. Um, I remember waking up in the middle of the night one time and thinking, I can't do a book. I mean, I just, there's no way I can put together a book. It just seemed like such a big uh, thing to put together. Um, but then I thought, well, what would Stella Martin think if I, if I bombed out on this thing? Um, Stella adopted me and gave me her name. Yonda Yane, um, and I'm very honored by that. But I also understand that there's a lot of responsibility that comes with carrying um, a name like that. And so I think that um, even though she had passed away by the time we were in the middle of this book, um, that she kind of was up there pushing and uh, making sure that this book got done. Um, Liz Dodd, who is here today, she's the one that she's going to make a presentation, as I said. Um, Liz was very helpful on uh, getting this book actually wrapped up into the printer. As I said, uh, she edited the, um, the book. 
I, I learned that you call yourself an editor of an oral history. Um, I, I went back and forth on that. You know, is it by Kim Metcalf or, you know, but uh, she set me straight and said that, no, you're the editor because it is, after all, an oral history and it's their story. It's not mine. So, uh, but she uh, was incredibly uh, good resource for the technical aspects of putting a book together. And uh, she's also my partner in a business venture called Hazy Island Books. Um, that's the publishing company that we put together to publish this book. And I would like to also name the sisters who um, died during this project. Um, it's, it was a real lesson to me that if you're, if you're thinking about interviewing uh, your family members or thinking about doing an oral history project, do it now because um, you, know, you just realize that this is a generation that's passing. And so I wanted to name um, the, the women who died during the project. Um, of course, Bessie Visaya, there's an interview with her. She died in 1996 before we got started with the project, but there was a nice um, interview of hers that we used. Um, and Olga Wilson died much before the project was uh, underway, too. But uh, we included her because so many people remembered her. Um, they had really fond memories of Olga and her connection with uh, Camp 2. But uh, during the project, Cecilia Coons, Liz Walters, Stella Martin, Harriet Roberts, Dorothy Thornton, Marge Morgan, Emma Olson, Emma Widmark, Dorothy Wallace, Amy Nelson, and Judy George passed away. So I'd like to ask that we have a moment of silence um, for those women. Thank you. Uh, they were all wonderful in um, devoting some time to this project and supporting it. The, uh, as I said, the first thing I'd like to do is give um, Liz Dodd a moment to uh, do her part of the presentation, and then we will proceed with uh, asking the elders to talk about their lives and their involvement with the Alaska Native Sisterhood. So um, here's Liz Dodd. All right, um, is this working all right? Okay, uh, you know, I have, uh, I wrote a couple of pages out that I wanted to present here, um, but I really wanna get out of the way and let you hear from the uh, people who, some of the people whose stories are told in the book. Um, so I'll try and, you know, shorten it a little bit. Um, uh, but I'll write this up to go in anything that Peter Metcalf produces as a result of this conference because I think my experience with this book actually holds a lot of lessons for anyone who comes in, finds themselves uh, in this process between uh, uh, spoken word and written word. Um, uh, well, maybe I'll just blast through it kind of quickly. Um, as an editor and English professor, my training has led me to impose perfect English grammar and structure onto every sentence I touch. But all that training did me little good when it came to working with the oral narratives in, in sisterhood. In general, when working with oral narratives, you have to get over your attachment to perfect English sentence structure. No speaker uh, talks in perfect sentences, unless you're reading a dumb little paper like I am right now. Um, and if you're editing, uh, the words of someone whose first language is not English, if you try to impose perfect English grammar and structure onto his or her words, you end up not only distorting the person's voice and meaning, but in fact your edited text runs a very high risk of portraying the speaker as someone whose primary language is English, only, you know, they come across as undereducated or not too bright, right? So if you make these if you, if you take somebody's speech and turn it into perfect English, especially when someone's first language was not English to begin with, you end up making the person seem just kind of dumb, right? So, um, so when I sit down to edit, so when I sit down in general to edit an oral transcript, the threshold issue has to do with voice, especially when I sit down to edit something that's already been transcribing, meaning I had words and not sounds before me when I started the work on this project. But I have to ask myself, why do, what does the speaker sound like? I don't think I could have edited this book very well 
had I not had a year of clinical language studies with uh, Florence Shakley and Hans Chester at uh, UAS, and had I not grown up hearing the language spoken. Even growing up uh, what I sometimes, uh, under what I sometimes call Juno apartheid, uh, a non-native child could not help encountering Klingut conversations, occasionally when visiting a friend's house or at Foodland uh, or on the street. Um, in the 1950s and 60s, the language was still heard around town, so I was very grateful to have heard the original language of these speakers um, and, uh, and to be able to access that voice in my head as I was working with these transcripts. But the process of editing these transcripts into what we now read in, in Sisterhood uh, was nevertheless a perilous process. Really, if you're a serious professional editor, what you worry about most with any project is distorting the text you're handling. And all these little decisions you make about spelling and punctuation and sentence breaks and paragraph breaks and what stays and what goes out and what gets moved and what stays where, it is, you know, uh, the, the peril is that you will end up distorting the original meaning and in this case, very importantly, the original voice. Um, when I say the work was perilous, what I'm really talking about is that the journey of a body of words from spoken or oral form to written form is by its nature a perilous journey. It's perilous for the words themselves. Um, I knew that in my hands the words were in peril. It's like the words have to cross, you know, like Ock Lake, but it's not the Ock Lake the words grew up around, the lake the words know, or that knows them. Rather, they have to make their way through a bunch of jet skis and rubber rafts and things that don't have much to do with the world associated with the original words or the speaker of the original words. You know, so, so the words, you know, when you take something that comes out of an oral tradition and you start writing it down, you know, you may want to be the raft that's carrying the words across this journey, but oftentimes, you know, if you're not of the culture that you're writing down, you just end up being one of the jet skis that screws up all the words that you're trying to write down, right? You know? So, um, so what are the chances that the words are going to arrive on the other side of the lake in one piece? Always. Uh, when you're going from oral to written, always the answer is the chances are not very good that something's not going to be distorted. So, uh, and Marie and uh, Nora have heard me say this before, I realized the minute I sat down with this project to work with the words in this project that something very precious had been placed into my care. Um, these words were going to pass through my pen and how they looked when they got to the printer mattered a lot. Under Clinkett rules governing handling of stories as atu or property, these words were in fact artifacts that I was sort of carrying back to the Clinkett women or the families of the Clinkett women who had passed away before the book was finished uh, and to the Clinkett community overall. In an act of, so that's, uh, you know, returning these words was, it was an act of return. In a way then, this book represents a kind of repatriation but it would be a sad, sad moment. This is what I realized when I sat down to work on this, that it would be a sad, sad moment if when the people who are receiving their stories back break open the crate, which is to open this book, and find everything inside broken. And uh, I think this is a sadness not unfamiliar to uh, you all when it comes to breaking open books to inspect the word, the artifact words that are inside. Oftentimes you find the words have been broken. Um, uh, so as the editor of this project, my task was to handle this English version of Clinkett thought by manipulating all the little things that make up the language in a way that helped to retain the voice and meaning of the speakers who had entrusted their stories to the In Sisterhood project. And the way I did this was by manipulating punctuation and sentence structure. Uh, because whether or not English uh, readers, I mean any readers, recognize it uh, consciously, we proceed slowly or quickly through a text, uh, depend, and we stop and go as we're reading, depending on punctuation, sentence endings, paragraphs, things like that. Um, uh, for example, if you see an, one of these dashes, an M dash, you stop for longer than you would for a comma or even a period, right? 
So the first job I saw was to reduce the speed of these uh, texts. As I was writing, as I was, you know, crafting these, the results of these interviews, these oral interviews, into the, the text that you read in this book. So in order to get the tenor of the voices that I recognized from my youth, from my studies, I had to manipulate things like punctuation. Uh, because you, ha you know, the text in an English way of speaking is uh, really fast, but I had to use punctuation to get the right rhythm of the more deliberate voice of a Klingit speaker. Um, and another thing I had to do was to, you know, allow the direction, the sentences to change direction. Because if you're editing an English text that was written by an English speaker, you, you know, beginning, middle, and end. That's how Western Europeans organize their thoughts and how they organize their writing. And, uh, and so, um, but here you had to allow for return, for repetition, for things to be uh, said more than once, I mean, very frequently. And you know, that comes out of this oral uh, form because, you know, when things were, when important stories and, doc and uh, uh, mores and thoughts were only transmitted orally, you have to say things more than once. If you're sitting around the fire out there in the house at the old Aknu village, and you're teaching something to children, you have to say things more than once. And so the Klinkit language is full of uh, repetition. And these speakers in this book repeat, repeat, repeat. And, you know, if you don't know anything about the language or about the origins of the language or about how oral uh, societies work, then you're going to clean that up, you know, to make it all linear. So there was, a, a again, a thanks to my to Florence and Hans for teaching me how this language works and for the people who took time to speak to me when I was a child and now. Um, because if you hear the, those proper rhythms and you understand those conventions, then you are allowed to, it enables you to work with the text in a way that is more closely honors the original uh, spoken text of the people who were interviewed. So um, I don't want to keep going on and on, um, but uh, what I want to do is give you an example of what I'm talking about. Um, I'm going to read to you a little section here from um, uh, Cecilia Kuntz's, uh, uh, her, the, you know, what ended up going into the book from her interview. Here's, here's what Cecilia Kuntz uh, said. We used to go on picnics. Now we don't. We used to go to Sandy Beach. We used to go to the ferry boat landing on the other side of the ferry boat landing, you know, Indian Point. We didn't have it at the point, but farther up. The Indian people used to go there. Oh, that's A and B. We used to rent a bus. All of us used to go. Oh, and when it's going out, the people will be singing. They'll be singing Indian songs while we're going out on the bus. We'd eat white man's food, Indian food. We barbecue fish, like long time ago, dry fish we toasted. Gee, I haven't had dry, toasted dry fish for how many years? It's good by the fire, wood fire, not electric. That's what we used to have in A and B too. My family is the one that used to take dry fish out there. Now that's Cecilia Kuhn's reporting on this just small, you know, this important uh, part of, of her life. Now, if, were this to be edited in the traditional way that you edit a text, if you're an English-trained uh, Western European editor, uh, here's how you'd say what Cecilia Kuntz just said in that paragraph, and what I feel we allowed her to say her way. Uh, here's how we would have said it. Um, we used to go on picnics, but now we don't. We used to go to Sandy Beach and to the other side of the ferry landing beyond Indian Point on a bus the A and B rented. On the way, we'd sing our songs, and once there, enjoyed all kinds of food, including not only the white man food, but toasted dry fish, too, that my family would always bring. It tastes much better cooked over the fire than in an electric stove. So uh, had the book been edited that way, uh, that would have been awful. Awful. You have to agree, right? Uh, so uh, the reason that I wanted to give this uh, little presentation today, and I think there's no place better to give it than at this Klan conference, is because I think in my experience of working with this text, taking these oral stories and putting them in this book, I actually 
uh, I ran into something, I found myself in the middle of something that I'd been reading about for a long time. I mean, I've read a lot of the academic stuff and, and all of uh, Nora and Richard's books on, you know, what happens to text in the oral to written transition. But to be right kind of inside the belly of that uh, process was interesting. And I think, um, uh, I hope to write maybe more on on it uh, so that everybody understands. I mean, uh, I was trying to be a raft that brought these words across the lake. But I know at times I was this, you know, the jet ski. I know that uh, when you when people, I'm, I'm positive, in fact, people have told me, when you open this text to read these words, you open the box of these artifacts, of these repatriated stories, you do find that there are some that are dinged up and cracked by virtue of who did the editing, right? So uh, it's really important who does that stage of the work. Um, uh, I hope that we can cultivate uh, native writers and editors who can, who organically have this information, who didn't learn it from, who aren't Western Europeans, who learned it from their Clinket teachers, but who organically understand how this language works. Uh, because as it gets written down, which it is getting written down, it shall get written down, there's no stopping that train, uh, that it gets, that, that as little is lost as is possible. So anyway, uh, thank you for listening to this presentation. I apologize for taking so long, but I think it's important. And uh, 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 I just want to finally say that I really loved working on this project. This was, uh, um, it was a true homecoming for me uh, onto the divided yet nonetheless shared ground of uh, my childhood. And uh, I think the same is true for Kim. We very much enjoyed producing this book. And when we went to, we had that original book signing at, when the ANS put on the, oh, the signing for the original party for this book. It was uh, just one of the happiest moments of my life to look out and see people opening this book and pointing at pictures and pointing at paragraphs and uh, sharing it. All these people, you know, who had ancestors that grew up in that village that I really didn't spend a lot of time in when I was a kid, but I always knew it was there. To me, it felt like uh, 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 just an immense privilege to be able to be uh, in that world in this very minor kind of custodial way. So I hope we did, uh, <laughs> we didn't do too bad of a job, and we uh, really thank you all for entrusting us with this really important project. Uh, again, sorry for taking so long. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. I'm going to go through a few slides here, make it real quick, because I really do want to get on to the, uh, the important part of the presentation, which is hearing from these folks here. Um, we dedicated this book to the elders, and uh, this is a, a picture of many of the elders who you will recognize, uh, Eunice Akagi, Elizabeth Govina, Dorothy Wallace, Emma Horton, Nancy Jackson and Amy Nelson. Is that right? I always get Amy's last name wrong. Um, this was a typical meeting when we first started the project. You can see that Emma Olson and Harriet Roberts were still with us. And Alberta Aspen was the president of the camp. There's Dolores getting up to speak. Um, and you can see other people that were at the meeting. This is our heritage committee that we uh, we um, organized to help advise on the book. And you can see Judy George and Cecilia Coons were among that group. Um, also Harriet and Emma, Dorothy Wallace, um, all very active members of the camp at the time. This was in 2001 when we started this project. Uh, this is the Alaska Daughters, the precursor to the Alaska Native Sisterhood. Um, these women were organized uh, in Christian women's societies throughout Southeast. Uh, this was the group in Juneau. Um, none of them, unfortunately, have been identified in this photo. I'm sure there are people that could identify them, but I was not able to um, get IDs for them. Well, I see Rosa is identifying them right now. <laughs> uh, this is uh, Alaska Native Sisterhood Grand Camp Convention in 1929 in Haines. Uh, this is a 1930 Grand Camp Convention in Ketchikan. You'll notice their um, bobbed hairdos. I think those are really cute. 
Uh, this is the Juneau Indian Village in the early 1900s. You can see that the hillside's been shaved pretty good up there with, of all the timber, but see how big the village was then. This is uh, Julie Williams, whose photographs from her Aunt Lizzie Wise's collection appear. Uh, she was very generous with those pictures, giving them to us to use in the book. Um, it just shows you that this one album was just a treasure trove, and um, I told her that she really should try and preserve it. It's some absolutely incredible pictures. Here are some of them. Unfortunately, they don't uh, show up too big on the screen here, but you can see how elegant and beautiful these women were um, probably in the 1920s and 30s in these photographs. Um, this is 1918, not long after the A and B started. This was Juno uh, sending its boys off to war in the World War I. Um, another shot, I just wanted to sort of set the tone for when um, the A and B and A and S began. And this is uh, uh, men going off to France from the Juno Boat Harbor. Uh, this is a Red Cross nursing corps. There were 18,000 nurses um, in the Red Cross nursing corps during the 1918 epidemic. As you notice, these are Klinka women. They were segregated by race. Um, this is uh, Maggie Anderson and Lizzie Wise, sisters whose uh, photographs again come from Julie Williams. Um, that's Johnny Wise, Lizzie Wise, Maggie Anderson, and an unidentified man in their um, holiday finery. Lizzie Wise, there was a picture very similar of her husband, Johnny. I love this picture. She looks so cute with that rifle. <laughs> this is the original A and B Hall. Um, I was, it took me a while to find a picture of that, but it seems like once I found one, I found a bunch. And this is an article from the Juno Empire um, talking about how they towed this building across Gastineau Channel from Douglas. They bought it from the, um, I think it was the Serbian, uh, minor group uh, across the channel and floated it across intact and uh, not anything was damaged. <laughs> it's amazing what they did in those days. Um, here's another picture of the village with the government school in the foreground and the old A&B hall on the um, left hand side of the picture. Uh, this is a government school that many of these women went to. Um, and this is a wonderful picture that I cropply uh, allowed us to use. It's his grandma, and he can talk about her, I hope, when um, he gets a chance to talk. This is her fish camp near where the uh, Juneau International Airport is today, so you can see there really was urban subsistence in Juneau. Uh, this is another favorite from the book. This is Liz Walter's high school basketball team. Liz is fifth from the right. It's a wonderful picture. Um, this is Bessie Visaya, who got uh, Camp 2 started in Juneau. She was one of the original founders who went door to door collecting money and um, convincing people to form the Alaska Native Sisterhood Camp 2. Uh, Cecilia Coons, who uh, was a camp mother and camp critic, she was um, also very involved from the outset of uh, Camp 2, one of our terrific advisors. Uh, this is Cecilia's dance group. Um, all of them are identified in the book. Um, another picture of Cecilia and Ed Coons in the Thunderbird House, which um, was next door to her own house in the village. This is uh, Ed and Priscilla Coons. Um, we went down and Peter and I uh, interviewed them, and uh, they were very generous with their time and information. And I really like that picture. That's a picture that Peter took. And there's Ed Coons. He's going to speak to us uh, in a little bit here. And Walter Soboloff was incredibly generous um, with lists of people who were involved in uh, Camp 2. He came here in 1940 and immediately got involved. Um, he was a tremendous asset to this project, and his interview appears in the book. He uh, could not make it today because of gold medal. <laughs> He's got his priorities. Uh, this is Memorial Presbyterian Church, the church that Walter was pastor of for, I think, 20 years. Uh, Judy Franklin was an early education advocate coming out of Juno Douglas High School. Um, she went on to be the first native elected to the Juno School Board in 1969. It seems uh, outrageous that it took that many years to get a native on the school board, but uh, she broke the barrier there, the racial barrier. Stella Martin, who I've mentioned, um, you know, very important person to me and um, also to Camp 2 and Camp 70 later on. 
Um, and this, these are the final photos. This is Cypec Jr. Um, he and I went out to interview Elizabeth Martin, who is here today, and uh, this is just uh, an example of uh, an oral history interview. And those are all the photos we have, and I'm going to turn it over to the ladies. Um, Liz, did you have something else? I have to go back to editing sausage at the Juno, at the Alaska State Legislature. They're waiting for me. Uh, so, Dolores, why don't you come up and take my seat? And, uh, <laughs> come on, Dolores. I thought you thought you could get out of it, but I've nailed you. And uh, thank you all. I, I'm sorry I can't stay. I'll watch the uh, recording. Okay. I really apologize for leaving out. Thank you, Liz, for your... Uh, that darn job. Yeah. <laughs> Paying the bills. Um, I'm going to turn this over. We've got uh, folks sitting down here. Um, but I think I'm going to go in sort of chronological order. We've got Rosa Miller here, and um, Rosa's mother was Bessie Visaya, who was uh, the person that, as I said, uh, one of the original founders of the camp. And then I'll go to Cecilia's family, because she was kind of next in line chronologically. And then uh, we'll go down the line. So Rosa, would you like to start out? One, one second. I've asked these uh, folks to talk about their lives and um, the influence of the Alaska Native Sisterhood on their lives. So here's Rosa. My name is Rosa Miller. My Tlingit names are Tseistan, Stu'u, Sina'at, and Nechchisi. I remember my mother telling me that she went to a convention and she was so impressed by what she saw that she came back and uh, knocking on doors, talking to people, and that's how the ANS was started here. Back in those old days, back in the old days, uh, it seemed like we all worked together, and uh, there was a lot of respect for one another. It was a really happy time for me. When they formed the junior ANS, I joined when I was 12. I am now 82, and I will be 83 in July. I, uh, when I raised my fa started raising my family, I kind of dropped off, but my mother was paying my dues, and then I started getting active again, and I really enjoyed being with the sisterhood, it, which made my mother happy because she had five daughters and I was the only one who, who joined. My daughter that was sitting behind me, she joined when she was 12 also. But I, I remember a lot of things, uh, the old hall. Uh, there was a lot of functions there, especially wintertime. There was always something going on there. And we spent a lot of time there. It was a beautiful hall. Upstairs was the banquet room. And uh, both sides, as you come in the door, one side was the A and B, the other one was the A and S, and then a uh, place to hang up your coats. And the back was the stage and the dressing room. I thought it was beautiful. We spent a lot of time there, especially winter time. I wish it was like that again. <laughs> But time goes on. But anyway, uh, like I said, I really enjoyed being with the ANS. And uh, I put together an album, my mother, from my father and my mother's album. And I put pictures in there. I think the earliest one I have on there is 1912. And I still have some more to add. And I'm thinking of donating it to the uh, ANS next time we have uh, the convention here, the Grand Camp Convention, because a lot of the elders enjoyed looking at it when I did bring it to the A and B Hall. And it's nice to see the young ones joining, and hope they enjoy it as much as I did. Thank you. And now I'd like to give uh, Cecilia's family a chance to talk, and then we'll come back um, up here on the platform and let uh, the other um, elders speak. So, um, Ed, do you want to talk for Cecilia's family? I mean, the rest of you are welcome to talk, too, of course.
Yes, I am hot. Look, I am hot. So, Tan, yes, I am hot. So, Tan, yes, I am hot. I am Tan, yes, I am hot. I am Raven. I am Koho. So, Tan is my ceremonial name. I'm from the house in front. And I'm a child of the Cogwell town. Both of my parents, my mother and father, were strong members of the A&B, A&S. My mother, when she was 19 years old, was excused from high school so she could attend the 1929 convention up in Haines. My Uncle Frank Kitka from Sitka was also a delegate to that convention. David Light, who was a son-in-law of Austin Hammond, wrote a book about the history of the a and in Haines. It was at that convention up in up in Haines that the Lansu issue came out. It was also at that convention where they decided to keep the grand president and form the executive committee. Also the A and B Kugana came out at that convention. David Light in his book said that there were 13 Kuganas made and they were all embroidered with the year 1929. This banner that I'm wearing used to belong to my uncle Frank Kitka who was a delegate at that convention. When Percy and I first joined the A&B, was when we first started going together. And my dad paid Percy's first year dues, which was $6 at that time. And that was a, that was a bargain for that initial investment of $6, the a and a and S got about 30 years of faithful, hard-working service. My wife Percy is an excellent role model for the young women who just joined. She's been president four or five times, and she inspires other members to work harder. My parents would be very proud of my niece, Mickey. She has, uh, for the last few years, has been second vice president, Grant Camp. The first year has, has uh, Second vice president was a hard battle. I think it went to four ballots, three ballots before she got elected. And the last two, last two conventions she ran unopposed. I joined the A&B in the early 70s. And it was during that first year when I became active in the a and after the, during the uh, first year when, toward the end of the year when the nominations were begun for the new president, uh, excuse me, for the new officers of the coming year, I was, I was nominated and became an officer 
my my first year as an active ANB member. And I have been an officer ever since. And since I'm 71 years old now, about half of my life has been as an officer with the A and B. Half that time has been with uh, as as a sergeant at arms with the A and B. Uh, one one year when the nominations began for the for the next year, uh, Alfred McKinley before he nominated me. He said, Brother Ed has been sergeant at arms since time immemorial. It's time we moved him up. Those were his words. But I thought about the term time immemorial, and I thought, yeah, that's pretty close. I remember, I remember when the first a &B Hall was on the other side of Willoughby. They had uh, sporting events there. My dad used to box there. I vaguely remember being in that building. The next hall was the little white hall next door to Jesse Wilson's house. Uh, the, entrance, the entrance was on the the village side. They held dances there. They held many dances there. My mother, my mother and father used to play at that dance. My mother played violin. My dad played steel guitar. Willie Peters, who was my neighbor, he played violin too. They had an instrument that we used to see at uh, canneries. It was made out of a wash tub with a stick coming up the side and a wire going down to the center of the drum, and it was used as a bass. And anybody who knew how to use it could play that during the dances. After the building was torn down and the foundation was being laid for the next hall, the a and had their visitors, I mean, had their meetings at different places. The Salvation Army Hall, the Thunderbird House, next door to our house, my mother's house, and other places. I, I never attended any of those meetings there. I, but I do remember my dad getting ready for, for meetings. He used to look forward to those, those meetings. In them days, all the men wore white shirts and ties. The portion of the meeting well, that was called uh, For the Good of the Order, my dad called story time. Men used to get up and tell stories of their clan. They're, my dad really enjoyed those. The new building that went on that foundation was a kind of a prefabricated building. It was made out of cedar. It was uh, put up in sections. And it stayed there for quite a while. When the new hall was being built, the present hall, that hall, the, sec the old hall, was put on skids and moved over into the parking lot. After we moved into the new building, which is now the A&B Hall, the old building, I think, was sold to the Boy Scouts it's out at the Boy Scout camp. At the time the meetings were held in the small white uh, building, many out-of-towners came uh, and a lot of them were leaders of their own village and they used to stop into my parents' house to pay their respects. My mother told me that 
their house was uh, <coughs> called the Kaguantan headquarters. I remember that Dr. Alfred Woodmark was a frequent visitor, and he and my dad discussed uh, business with the ANB about the ANB and different things concerning the ANB. And one of the one of the things that I was listening to while they were talking was when uh, Dr. Widmark was talking about the original A and B pin, and he was uh, he was describing it, telling telling my dad what it meant. I have I have one of those pins. I'm wearing one of those pins now that used to belong to. A uh, coho leader here in town. You saw his picture up on the screen a while ago. His name was Johnny Wise. He was my uncle. The pen itself has uh, the letters A and B mounted on a on an arrow, and the arrow is mounted on what looks like a gold pen, but it, uh, according to Dr. Widmark, it object that looks like a gold pan is actually a dish, and the dish represents the A and B. If you needed help, if you were in trouble, you would come to the A and B. And the A and B would help you. That, that, that was what he referred to as take it out of the dish. But you know, if you t took things out of the dish, it would soon be empty. So you have to put things back into the dish. And that's, that's what I, that's what I thought about, you know, and I, at, at a convention here in Juneau, yeah. I think it was 92, uh, I was a I was a delegate. I was an alternate, and I felt I wasn't doing enough for the A and B. So I made a, a silver bracelet, and I turned it over. I was I was going to turn it over to the Grand Camp. Geraldine Williams was Grand Treasurer at that time. <clears throat> So I was, I was uh, trying to turn it over to her, telling her that was for Grand Camp, and she kept asking me, "Are are you, are you presenting it to the Grand Camp?" And I thought, you know, by using those words, she expected me to get up and make a speech. Uh, during them days, I was, uh, I was very, very shy. I I've gotten over it quite a bit, but it's still, it's. I still have uh, trouble. Well, they they accepted it, and uh, I just I just told him uh, how much it was worth, and to make sure. I I thought what they were going to do was have a Chinese auction. You know, everybody held up a dollar, and after a certain point. Uh, the winner would get that bracelet. But what they did was raffle it off. So uh, <coughs> after I after I turned it over to the grand camp, I, I felt it was none of my business what they did with it. And uh, I, I just told them that I was curious, you know, that I, I wanted to know how much they made at the raffles, and who won it. When they, f when, uh, when they first started doing that, I was kind of keeping track of who, who got the bracelet. Every once in a while, somebody would come up to me and show me, hold their hand out, you know, and show me the bracelet, and I feel really good about that. It's good to see those. I spent a lot of time, put a lot of love into those. So it's good to see those. 
When I speak of the A and B, I also speak of the A and S, just as one organization. I don't think of my, I don't think of them as uh, separate. I I started getting requests for that bracelet, and uh, I made a promise to the ground camp that I. I wouldn't make them for sale. And the only way that you could get a bracelet would be to buy a ticket at the convention. So I know my wife would like one of those bracelets, but I made a promise to the Grand Camp that I, I, uh, the only way you can get one is to win it at the convention, so that's what we do. We both buy tickets for uh, the bracelet, and so far, no luck. I will, I will, uh, as, as I said, I'm 71 years old now, and as long as I, I can carve, I will keep doing that as long as the sisterhood will accept it. They will get one every year. <clears throat> I really don't have anything to do with the RAF or the Grand Camp does that. They raise sometimes a pretty good amount. Maybe half a dozen times they raised over 2000 for a single bracelet. A lot of times over a thousand. Doing those things, raising that amount of money is one of the many reasons that the sisterhood is called the backbone, the backbone of the A and B. They can do those things. From the beginning, when the forerunner of the ANS, the Alaska Daughters, when they bought that hall, that Juneau Hall over in Douglas, and it was floated over to Juneau, <coughs> the ANS has been the backbone of the A and B. During the summer, my wife and I, we both worked for Gold Belt. Uh, many people, many tourists coming through here still think that any native in Alaska is an Eskimo. So we we talked to them about our culture. We talked to them about the Clinket people, our culture, our regalia, and our lifestyle, and our food, and how it's preserved. And after after our presentation, you know, we have a a question and answer period. And every once in a while, somebody would uh, notice a pin that I wear on my tunic on my shoulder. It has a picture of Elizabeth Pradovich, and so I get to I get to talk about the A and B. You know, every every school student knows who Elizabeth Pradovich and what she and her husband did for for the A and B, what the Grand Camp did for the A and B. On our, on our membership card, there's a list of accomplishments at the A and B. There are 10 of them. Initiated click and hide a lawsuit. Got equal rights law brought hospitals to natives to, to Alaska under the U.S. Public Health Service, secured direct relief for aid natives, included natives in aid to dependent children, extended workers' compensation to cover all integrated public schools, 
won the right for natives to vote, gained recognition of native rights as citizens. A lot of these things I was I was born into, so I, I never knew a time when I didn't have those rights. <clears throat> And I think that there are a lot of, lot of young children who are going to school now who are the same way. They never had a time when we did not have those rights. And I know they're all familiar with the, our way of life, traditional tribal values. We have several of these posted up in our house. What I think would be a good idea would be to have the accomplishments of the A and B printed up in the same style and passed out to the children at school so they can know what the A and B is, what they've done, and what they're still doing. Children now are are much, much smarter than, than I was when I was an actor age. We went to, Percy and I went to, uh, as delegates down to the 95 convention at Heidelberg. And during the meetings, the, uh, one of the teachers brought her students to watch to watch what was going on at our conventions. And these students were very respectful, quiet. The, the meeting hall was like the, like the gym. Our old high school gym had had a balcony all around, and that's where they sat. and witnessed what a first-class organization did when they took care of business. They even joined in whenever there was a impromptu fundraising there, when there was a Chinese auction. They were up there too with their dollar bills trying to win something. At the banquet, they did, they handled all the KP duties. They waited on the delegates. At the swearing in of the new officers, when the call went out to members to join, maybe about 20 or 25 of them came out in a bunch to join the A and B. I had nothing to do with their upbringing, but I was, I was so proud. They are what we need in this organization. Young, eager, honest, and hardworking people. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. All right. Um, we need to the gym.
I'd like to refer to my elders uh, first. And, you know, I know that they're sitting here and I know that they're hungry. <laughs> but uh, I would like to first uh, start by giving you my uh, Klingit name. My name given at birth is Gludas, and I'm Eagle Take D, a daughter of the Brown Bear House of Angoon. I'd like to say daughter because I don't feel like I'm old enough to call myself a woman yet. But I do know that my actions and my words, I hope, speak very well for my family and my clan. My mother is here, Irene Cadiente and uh, she is Irene Hunter Cadiente. So if she would stand up. She is why I'm here today. And she is why I have the strength, the courage, and the dedication to do what I do today. And then I have my sister, uh, Barbara uh, Cadiente Nelson, here. And I'd like her to stand up, too, and be acknowledged and recognized. Because we come from a good, strong stock. Um, and my niece, Dion, Cadiente Lighty Blattner, and she's part of the uh, planning committee for this conference, and I'd like her to stand and be acknowledged and recognized as well. You know, it always takes somebody, a leader, right, to start paving the way, and then when you're doing some good things, other people join in. And I have to say that because that is why I came here to the Alaska Native Sisterhood back in 1989. We had a lot of issues that I was experiencing with my grandchildren, and that was fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. My son married a girl with two children. They came uh, with disabilities. We lost the first one within six months uh, because of her medical disabilities. So when I came, I, I thought that the sisters needed help, and they did. But we didn't know what to do. So what can we do and how can we help? Then there were other issues that came to surface. So I got involved with education, with health issues. And, and uh, we, we I, I guess uh, when I say we, I represent the sisterhood on a lot of different committees. And that's the uh, foster care and recruitment and retention. We don't have enough native foster homes. Our numbers are high here in Juneau. 73% of our children in Juneau are Clinkett and Haida. We need. I believe, as a clan, to start stepping forward like we used to do in the past. I know that my mother, all of a sudden we would have a child in our home or a body in our home that we didn't question why they were there. They were taken care of by the people. And that's the strength that I found in our people back in the day of our, you know, I guess our culture, our values. And so I wanted to go back to our values. What can we do and how can we help? where you have a lot of our future leaders in the foster care system. What can we do? How can we help? If you would open up your hearts and your homes, we can do something, even if it helps one child. How do we strengthen families and individuals like we used to do? What can we do? How can we help? Health issues, social service issues, it, and believe it or not, discrimination issues, right? used to be pretty, you know, blatant. Now it's really hard to tell. Now I'm looking at policies and procedures. I don't care who you are, what color you are. If you don't change those policies, procedures within the same uh, uh, agency or organization, whoever fills that position, they're going to do it in the same way. So let's start looking at some of those. So there's a call to action out there yet. And I enjoy what our elders have fought for in the past. I enjoy that. You enjoy that today. As our brother Eddie said, we need to start filling the bowl back up. We have eaten from that bowl. We have enjoyed that. Now it's our turn to fill that bowl and keep it full for our people, using our cultural our traditional values. Now. I sit up here and I feel kind of uncomfortable because I'm a baby yet, like I said. And I have so many elders here that sit among us that have done so much for so many. And so I am going to defer the rest of my comments to them. But I thank you for being here. I thank you for doing what you're doing. I thank you for preserving our culture. But part of that is our children, our future leaders. I used to hear the elders say, I'm doing this for my grandchildren, for our unborn. Now think about it. We have a lot of them that are out there that are in need of our, our help, our assistance. And we still need the same dedication, the commitment, and the courage to keep moving forward. Our banner calls on us to move forward. We're not static. Nor has our culture ever been static. 
we've always adopted, adjusted, and modified. And I hope that we do that today, and I hope our children hear your voice. I hope our children see you in action. And I hope they see me yet in responding to that as well, because I do the best that I can. And I, and I look forward to joining you in the work that you do as well. Preserving our culture is pre preserving our history, preserving our children, preserving our families. Grunstisch. I'd like to uh, hear next from Elizabeth Martin. Um, I believe she's probably the eldest among the group. Uh, she's originally from Angoon. And um, her interview in the book is wonderful. She also uh, gave us some wonderful photos to use in the book. Uh, she told some wonderful stories about growing up in Angoon, and I'm hoping that she'll uh, tell us a couple more right now. Here you go, Elizabeth. Thank you. <laughs> I'm from Angoon. I was raised over there. And I lived there quite a while, and I came over to Juneau in 1940. And my mother used to, we used to go to the dancing and all the things going on. And my mother told me I have to learn how to do the Indian dance. And I went out with her, and when we first danced, I left all through the way. And my mother took me out of there. She said, you're not supposed to laugh. <laughs> but I couldn't. That was the first time I ever joined it. But it was nice, and I really enjoyed it. But I had a lot of fun, even to this day. And she told me that we have to be solemn, not to laugh. <clears throat> and then when my brother was here, he comes over every year and he said, how come you don't go to the A and B hall? Well, I said, I don't belong to anything there. Well, he said, you could transfer from Angoon. You still go to the ANS? No. Well, he said, you better get transferred to Juno. So I went and worked on it, and I did. I wrote a letter, and I came back. He sent me a letter back. We joined ANS in Angoon. I think I was only about 12 or 13 years old. And then we st I started over here. I'm very interested in the ANS, and I enjoy it. All the things we do and take care of to help other people. I really like it. I never want to miss any of the meetings, but the transportation is kind of hard in the winter, so sometimes I don't get over to the meeting. But that kind of hurts. And I like the culture. I know my culture. And the things that I had to put on my blanket and my uh, vests and dancing outfit. And so that's what goes on. And I like to see other people come and take interest in everything of our culture. I really like it. Thank you.
I'm not sure if we should <laughs> go in order of age because I don't want to ask anybody how old they are. <laughs> but I would like to hear from Mike Cropley, too. He's uh, sitting behind. I wonder if we can get him up in front here a little. You want to trade places, Dolores? Would you mind? Okay. I, could you come up and sit up front here? Ike Cropley's family um, has been a, a historic family in Juneau. Um, I'll let him tell you about it, but they, um, Cropley Lake up on, in West Juneau is named after his family, and they were um, very important in mining um, in, in the old days in Juneau. Are you situated there, Ike? You want to have him talk a little about his family and um, the ANS and the ANB? His uh, grandmothers were very, um, very active women, too. And, and, and also, the photo on your program for this uh, conference is the one that Ike uh, let us use for the book. And he also let us use it for the program for this conference. Here you go, Ike Cropley. One, two, three, four. <laughs> yeah, I think. Uh, <clears throat> The first thing I do if I was a boss came, I get a, a different kind of system here. I haven't heard anybody talking yet that I could hear. But what I what I really wanted to say is is uh, if any of you haven't read that book yet that that Kim made. Better get it. Every time I look at mine, I have to pick it up and read. I like it so much. It's it's right to the point, and uh, has information that uh, <clears throat> some of you might not have. I like the picture she used of my my grandmother's smokehouse. <laughs> it reminds me how much I have to go and uh, the problem we had was talking cricket our folks wouldn't teach us because when they talk cricket they got punished and they didn't want us to go through that so my mother and my grandmother used to fight every day to get together. Grandma wanted us to, t wanted us to learn to talk clinket, and mother said, no, no, she wouldn't do it. The only thing I remember, really remember, that my mother, mother taught me was grandma told her I won't give Ike any fish unless he asks for it in cricket. So my mother taught me that. I can't remember what else she taught me, but I know she told me that. She says, it's easy, Achtawasika. You say that. <laughs> so I'd have to face up to my grandma and ask for dry fish in cricket, or she wouldn't give me any. But I do want to praise Kim Metcalf for, for the for the book she put up. It really has a lot of good information in it about cricket people. I don't mind saying I'm, I'm kind of one way when I talk about Alaska. As far as I'm concerned, the only Alaska is Southeast Alaska. The, up at the frozen north is that, and uh, I see that in the news all the time, but it's always about the great frozen north and not, not about southeast Alaska. Anyway, this is every time.
And now I think we'll go down the, the row for the ones that we haven't heard from rather than ask who's older. Um, Marie Olson has been a, f a wonderful uh, member of Camp 2 for many years, and um, I'll let her talk a little about her experience with uh, ANS Camp 2 and her life in general. Here you go, Marie. Good night, Chish. Briefly, Kayistan, you do a sock link at Reinach. Um, Anchka to a dach. Ach ishkoa, sheet kadach. Kaji, han, you do a sock link at Reinach. Ach silk, Atlain dach. Kaji Han you do it. No, no, no. His name was um, Yakushi. When I was growing up, I left Alaska. I left Juno because of racism. And I was educated in Seattle, Washington, and close to San Francisco at Berkeley. I returned home. And I, someone told me that there was no more racism, and I was delighted, so I agreed to come back home to Juneau because that's where my ex-husband was teaching. We went out to a movie, and I looked around, and I said, no, racism is not dead in Juneau. It's gone underground. And I proved it to him. I read the history of the Alaska Native Brotherhood, and I was very impressed with their program, what they were fighting for. Education was one of their platforms. I know they won workmen's comp for the Native employees. Before that, they were ignored as far as getting any kind of compensation when they were injured on the job. They were going for equal education, and I can attest to that because I went to a segregated school, elementary school. And I have to say that Tlingit was my first language, and my first day in school was very traumatic. I came home crying because I couldn't understand what that white teacher was talking about. Furthermore, it hurt my feelings a lot because she put me in a corner for using my language. Their other platform was health, and that we now have our own uh, health center search, which is takes care of all of the natives in Southeast. The Alaska Native Brotherhood and the Alaska Native Sisterhood are indeed historical. It's a beautiful historical organization, and I am glad to be part of it. I served in several capacities from, from um, president first vice president underneath my aunt Emma Olson, who really beat me in order to learn some of the things that I had to do as president. Second vice president, I thought I was going to get out of some work. No, no, that didn't change. I got into more work. Recording secretary and um, financial secretary, and I know there's some people out here that I used to put my hand out to quite a bit, right, Nancy, to, to get their dues. I collected them. And now I'm um, taking care of the money. I'm now the treasurer. And I'm learning how to balance well, I already know how to balance, and I already audit for the grand camp, the AMS. I have enjoyed being a member of the Alaska Native Sisterhood, especially when it comes to the grand camp convention. I have been the on the citizenship committee and the 
It's been a joy working with them. And one of the fellows that worked for me, worked with me, is right back there, Bert Adams, who wrote the resolutions for citizenship. I, I've enjoyed it a lot, and I, I think I'll stay in it, uh, even if I get a bad audit. Thank you, Marie. And next, uh, Nora Downhauer. Nora probably needs little introduction in this group. She's written some incredible books um, and given so much to the Clinkett, uh, uh, about Clinkett history to all of us. Here's Nora Downhauer. Good night, Um I'm Sakaksha Kaykney Hatuasak Akhil Chakutin Titas Ay Aya Akhiao Hutia Hatuasa Kokasti Akhatu Koa Asseh Tahoa Maybe I should just go ahead and switch to English. Okay. Uh, <laughs> my uh, mother came from Alsek River. And uh, she came from the Canoe Prow House, which was built by Satan, our leader, in Alsek River. And the other name, other than Shukalkhadi was Kunakhu uh, Kwan from Kunakaa. Kunakaa is Dry Bay. And we came from there with my mother. But my grandfather, who gave me my name, Jakutin, came from. Haines Seven Mile Village. The uh, they call it in history books Yande Stucky. And uh, it's really Yande Stakye in Slingit. I'm very happy that I'm here to uh, share my a little of my background. And my father came from Huna. He was Chukunedi. And um, he's a descendant of the people that came from Glacier Bay, Chukunedi. So I'm happy to tell you that. Uh, sometimes people don't know who I am. <laughs> Anyway, I'll just quickly go over to what I think um, we should uh, talk about the book in Sisterhood. You want to lift it up? In Sisterhood, the book. <laughs> yeah, just to show it to somebody. Yeah. It's a very good book that Kim Metcalf um, edited. I really um, enjoyed doing my history with her. The cover I noticed, I don't know if everybody knows, but I'll mention that it was at the baseball park in Juneau. That baseball park was right down there where the federal building is. And I think that's where it was, yeah. So I'll just um, save time and give other people a chance to say something. Thank you. Thank you, Nora. I wish we had more time so these folks could tell uh, more stories there. Well, you got to read the book because their stories are in the book, and um, 
Boy, Nora's got a wonderful story of growing up in Graves Harbor and on board the boat, and um, you know, what a life she's led. It's amazing. Uh, and of course, as someone who likes hearing stories, I mean, you know, these are some of the best you're, you're going to hear, so I do hope you'll get a chance to pick up the book. Let's hear from Connie Monroe. Connie is the only non-native featured in the book. Um, she's featured in the book for a very good reason. She's done an incredible amount for the Alaska Native Sisterhood, um, especially in terms of education. She's uh, always been big on the GED and has uh, convinced many of the women of the Alaska Native Sisterhood to get their GED. And uh, nobody bakes as much for events as Connie Monroe. Uh, she certainly earned her place in the book. Here's Connie. Thank you. And like most non-natives, uh, we usually participate in the Alaska Native Sisterhood because we're e either running for office or we have a hidden agenda or Marie Olson has dragged us there. <laughs> uh, Edie Ibona took me to the first uh, meeting that I attended in 1971. Uh, because she was working for Model Cities and was responsible for recruiting Alaska Native persons uh, to get their uh, a GED and had just hired me as a VISTA volunteers to help them out. And so that's how I got my start. But I really got hooked, not because I was running for office or I needed to do this for work, but in the kitchen with Dorothy Wallace. And not only did she teach me how to cook, and Marie Olson teach me how to cook, but that's where all the, the family talk and the hugging and kissing and sharing um, was uh, held, was in the kitchen. And to this very day, that's where I want to be, is in the kitchen. I served under Emma Olson, Teresa Stitt, Dorothy Owen, Emma Widmark, Alberta Aspen, Dolores Carianti, Marie Olson and Mickley Kuntz, who is now my president. And I can't tell you that if the young people here, uh, and uh, by the way, men, we have three active male uh, members, and I know that the women also uh, are members of the A and B, but the young people especially, are. if there's some way that we can get you there and become a member, it's fine. Um, most of our members are supporting members because they work. And we have about 40 active members and the rest when we call you up and say, would you do this or that, they say okay. So we're very, very fortunate. I think Marie told us at one time we're the largest organization of members, uh, annual members in Juneau, Alaska. Is that not true? And I'm so proud of that and thank you all for giving me this wonderful heritage. Thank you, Connie. I know that we're going to run a couple minutes late here, but I also wanted to give Martha Benzel an opportunity to speak. Martha um, was born in Juneau, I believe, and raised here. Is that right? Well, well let, born in Sitka. Um, I believe she's a Jacobs. Isn't that right? And um, I'll let uh, Martha talk for a minute, and um, then if we have time, we could, um, um, Carol Brady is here, she's been an active member, and Carol Trebian, but here's Martha Benzel. Um, what I remember of that sisterhood is when I was born in Sitka, that my parents would go to the meetings at the a &B Hall. And one of the fondest recollections of was on Christmas where they had big tree in the hall. And I know as among the other children that there's a package under that tree with the name of Martha on it. And uh, then eventually we moved to Juneau and again my parents were involved in uh, supporting the sisterhood and the brotherhood. In those days, you know, there was no general funds to apply to run your organization. They raised their money. They gave a lot of benefits to raise money for many things. And I, when in Juneau, I remember 
the, they were talking about the land claims, suing the government for lands taken, and how the Brotherhood and Sisterhood would have fundraising monies to put their little dollars in to eventually send some people back to Washington, D.C. to speak on our behalf. And you, when you think of the ones that formed the organization and the, how they dream up, how they wanted to um, work on behalf of the people, an organization that would tackle many of the issues that are were abound then. And you think of these men and the wisdom they had and the um, many things in the Constitution that they thought of and then the work towards the betterment of the people. And you know, over the years I heard that we do this for our children. I will not benefit, but my children will if we work hard enough. And I've heard this through out the years and uh, when I got involved, that was my thing too. I got involved mostly in Anchorage. We, uh, I joined the Brotherhood to support them. We as the ones that were married to non-natives were helped our brothers form Alaska Native Brotherhood. And going to conventions, you see the Oh, so many people that gave and worked on behalf of the Brotherhood and the many issues that they won. And you know, uh, on that Native Issues Forum the other day, Al Kukash stood up and said, nobody gave you the right to vote. Nobody gave you this and that. You worked hard and fought for those issues. And the Alaska Native Brotherhood and Sisters are basis to those. And out of that organization, other organizations that now work towards the betterment of the people are here. And we need to remember those ones that went before us, and all that they've accomplished. And you know, when I went to conventions, uh, Roy Peradvich, William Paul, and others, and were, uh, they would uh, argue about issues, especially William Paul and Roy Peradvich, and they slammed their fists on the table and state their opinion or objection. And then those two would go out arm in arm after the session was over. And there was a lot of hard work, fisheries, education, our children. They're the basis of our survival is our children. We have, I'm like that Coho, I've, this old Coho is going upstream, going home. But I've got few little ones still left, but who's going to pick up that arrow? Who's going to do, put their, join the organization and say, I will continue the work for our children. It's been Anchorage and Seattle was where most of, and then oftentimes here. Uh, go 
don't let the words, I do this for my children, fade. Thank you, Martha. Um, how, how anxious are we to get us out of here? Steve, are you? Uh, uh, probably you could, you could go a few more minutes. Okay, good, thank you. I wanted to give, uh, Percy, would you like to say a few words? No, you sure? <laughs> well, I mean, I wanted to give you an opportunity. Um, Percy Coons and Mickey Coons McGee are um, two of the hardest working sisters you'll ever find. Uh, they've really um, done a lot for camp, too. Mickey, did you want to say a few words? Mickey's our president, sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Kim said, my, my, uh, everyone knows me as Mickey. My given name is Michaelin. The name that I treasure and honor highly um, was given to me by my uncle, his mother's name, Kintu, um, which was my grandmother's name, Cecilia Coons. I'm very honored to, to carry her name. I'm Raven Coho, and for the last three years, I've been uh, president of Alaska Native Sisterhood Camp 2. I also serve as second vice president for Alaska Native Sisterhood Grand Camp. Um, I'm very fortunate. Growing up in my grandmother's house, my mother was attending school at University of California in Santa Barbara. She did return home with a master's in political science, um, but I my grandmother wanted me to grow up here in Juneau. I'm so fortunate that I was able to do so. Um, my house was an ANS house. Um, every weekend, every every day of the week, there was an ANS doings. There was an ANS food sale. There was um, um, ANS ANS all all through the week, and so I grew up in that in that environment where we're being a part of a community caring for a community, upholding a community, and the people in the community was very important. Um, as you've heard my uncle and Dolores referred to as a bowl being full. Right now our bowl is full. It's full of the members that pave the way for our people. Um, right now there are, there are living treasures, there are elders. What concerns us now is the the younger people not getting involved. Um, I please I, I'm not saying I'm the youngest one here, but w when I when I sit with my living treasures, my elders, I do see an age difference. What I don't see are women of my generation standing up to take on these these tasks that have been put in front of us. Um, for ANS Camp 2, that's one of our goals this year, is to have a membership drive to see if we can encourage our younger members to take their place where their grandmothers, their aunties, their mothers wanted them to be. Um, you've all heard the term before, it takes a village to raise a child, in my case, it took ANS camp plus my family, and I'm so grateful that Alaska Native Sisterhood is a huge part of my life. And I, and Alaska Native Sisterhood camp number two is so proud of Kim and all the hard work her and Liz, Dolores, Alberta has put into this. Um, once again, it's, um, it's a life's work. But there's so much work, as Sister Dolores says, that needs to be done. So we, we will be doing our best in our community. Goodness, Chish. Thank you, Michael. Um, she has really made us proud as a camp, uh, Michael and Coons McGee. And Carol Brady has been a very active and wonderful member of our camp. She's also a writer, has written, I think, a couple books, haven't you, Carol? She's on her second one now. Okay, and we'd like to hear from Carol. Here's Carol Brady. Thank you very much, Kim. Yes, I guess we've seen a lot of mighty work done by our, the people that went on before us, and we need to really attract the young people to come because there's a strong camp here. There's two other camps here in Juneau. 
So um, they're mighty active and very attractive in everything they do. And the things that go on here today and during this conference makes me even feel more immersed in my feelings of being Alaska Native. <coughs> My mother, Elizabeth Kadishan James, was uh, one of the early grand presidents. And, you know, I haven't been a member of Camp 2 very long, but I feel like I have been longer than that because I've been so welcomed into this group. It changed me a lot. I uh, served a lot on the IRA in Wrangell for years and did a lot of resolutions concerning youth. So, uh, the problems and uh, some of them were really successful. I can remember things about when um, A and B, when I was very little in Sitka, and all these <clears throat> people were so dedicated. And I don't know, I guess I feel uh, like I have been part of the Alaska Native Sisterhood and Brotherhood for a long time because when we were little, they surrounded us. There was Andrew Hope, Frank Price, Peter Simpson, and uh, uh, my mother always kind of worked along with them. But <clears throat> they were so wonderful. I just have a flash of memory of when I was real little. Uh, we were standing outside the A&B Hall at night, and my mother had me by the hand, so I must have been very young. She was waiting for something. I guess all the delegates were coming to, coming to the convention, uh, and they were they were all coming on aboard sane boats. And uh, my mother was so excited. I felt the excitement. And somebody said, here comes a Wrangell boat. And uh, she was from Wrangell. She was born there. She's Nani she was Naniayi. Her dad was John Kadishan. And uh, she went running down the float. I just remember Louis Paul. I could never forget his, long, his white hair. Um, so these people were so dedicated. They, uh, they loved each other, and I remember, too, that there were a lot of carpenters amongst the Sitka A and B, Andrew Hope, Peter Simpson, my father, Ray James, uh, George Howard. They were all dedicated, and they were all so talented with what they did. They were really wonderful, and it's nice to have been living there. And Ellen remembers a lot of it. <laughs> she had a, she's been very deeply in with uh, her dad, who was wonderful. Yes. After my parents died, he, my mother, after my brothers died, my dad, well, Andrew Hope watched over us. He taught my brothers how to fit sane. So people like this have always impressed me, and uh, I hope we can go on impressing young people. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Carol Trebian, would you like to say a few words? Carol Trebian is uh, Marie Olson's sister, if you didn't know that, and um, here she is. <laughs> I hope I don't get wordy and make you late for your next session. My name is Carol Bacon Trebian. My mother's name was Sheik born in Douglas. My grandmother's name was Ka Istan, which happens to be my sister's name. I was born in Auk Bay. And I was gone for 50 years. That doesn't mean I turned my back on what I learned from my mother, but it kind of went to sleep until I came back here in 1993 and joined ANS and kind of woke up with a lot of prodding from my sister. Your dues are due, she would say. Anyway, um, I retired in 1998 and went right to work for the Indian program here in the schools. And there is where I realized that I had absorbed all of my own culture as I had grown up but I had never expressed it until then. And so I just was so blessed to realize this. 
because when I did realize it, I was amazed at the richness of our culture and so blessed by something like this happening that I could be a part of. I believe that's God's blessing on my life. And I want to recognize him today for giving me that back. I remember a present under the Christmas tree, like my sister here at an A and B hall that used to be on the what they called the flats here in Juneau. There was a Christmas present under that tree for me, and I I was really blessed by that. But I have a, an older memory too, and I must have been very very young because I didn't know what that was that they gave me at a memorial. It was round, and it was shiny, and it was heavy in my little hand. It was a dollar. I had been given, I had been paid for something at that memorial. I didn't realize it at the time, but that memory just blesses me now. It's so clear in my mind who I am because that showed me who I was at that time, standing there by my mother, my mother's knee. I must have been very, very young. And it's a healing thing for me to say this to all you people, and especially you people from inland, those are my roots. That's where my grandparents came from, down the Taku. I forgot to introduce myself, sorry. That kutiz ka yet kak uduhan yochat wasak shingit renach chag Wushkitan ayachat, akquan ayachat, gnalchish, gnalchish. There's much more I could say that would bring healing to myself, but I won't. I just want to recognize an old colleague there, uh, Nancy Douglas. She was my boss at one time in the Indian program. If you don't believe, me, remember that, and I. I, I really, really um, want to recognize her. For, uh, she stands for me. She stands for me in the area of education because that's what I did when I was her age. I went out to Chicago. I was a, a music student of Carol Beery Davis here in Juneau back in the 40s. I went out and got a music degree and then got married. My family is still living out there in the, in the Midwest, all grown up. They all have Shingit names. They know who they are, and they know their background, and they know they know their family. And we have we have uh, pictures. I was blessed to get pictures of my family. Probably when they first came down with their young family, because there's my mother and her sister and her baby brother, and her older sister, who eventually went to Chimawa, became a music teacher there and taught there. Long history, but it's those roots that you bring to remembrance. Again, atlain konachish, konachish ho ho, konachish. Thank you, Carol. And that will wrap it up. I want to uh, thank the sisters and the brothers again for allowing me to um, gather information about them. Uh, I, I'm very grateful that they're thanking me, but uh, for me it was an incredible honor to be able to do the book, and um, so I thank them again. And thank you for listening. I'm sorry we went a little bit late, but I think it was important to hear from all of them. Thank you very much.